The following presentation covers the manual recovery of data from flash memory using the master file table. Devices that use flash-based memory incorporate a number of different file systems to manage data. Most modern thumb drives use the FAT32 file system, although others in circulation use NTFS. Android and iPhone devices have their own file systems. However, none of these types of devices is immune to the challenges caused by wear leveling and flash translation. In the sections which follow, I will demonstrate manually how wear leveling and flash translation affect the management of stored files. Next, I will extract and recover a file from raw flash memory. Let's begin. I'm going to begin this lesson by giving you a visual demonstration of wear leveling and flash translation at work. This becomes an issue when we talk about things like the master file table, byte level offsets, and file recovery when it's done manually. This demonstration is only focused on recovery from flash media and not on traditional hard disk drives as most training courses on this subject are concerned. The reason for this is that when you're dealing with uh, file recovery from hard disk drives, you don't have things like wear leveling to deal with. The way that files are stored and retrieved is relatively predictable and reliable with the help of the master file table. Flash-based memory presents examiners and recovery specialists with a different set of challenges. In our current digital device landscape, the items that we carry around with us and use on a daily basis are mostly flash-based memory in, in nature. Smartphones, tablets, some laptop computers, thumb drives, and digital camcorders are but a few examples of the everyday devices that use flash memory. What you are currently seeing on your screen is the master file table record for a JPEG image that was stored on a thumb drive. The thumb drive was originally formatted in FAT32, but I reformatted it to use NTFS. I'm going to navigate to the location on the flash drive where this JPEG file's contents are stored in raw memory. Before I do that, I want to point out a few things in this MFT record concerning the JPEG file. The first item is at offset 22 of this record. The 01 that is at this location is a file status flag, which means that the object in question is a file which is currently in use. A zero at this location would mean that the file was deleted and the space that the JPEG occupied is available to be overwritten. This in turn would mean that the clusters which contain the JPEG's contents would be deemed by the file system to be unallocated. The second item that I would like to point out is at the very bottom of the master file table record. The final two attribute blocks of this record both begin with a hexadecimal signature of 80. Ordinarily, a master file table record will have one data attribute block unless there is an exception of some kind associated with the file. If you look at the second data attribute, in the ASCII column there is clear text which reads Zone Identifier, Zone Transfer, and Zone ID equals 3. This particular data attribute block with this text signature means that this JPEG has an alternate data stream. An alternate data stream is a feature of the NTFS file system which was based on Apple's resource fork. It is a storage option which gives you the ability to store files in an association with this file, but makes the stored file invisible to average users. Even though the hidden file is associated with this host file, the size and MD5 hash value of the host does not change. Hackers often use alternate data streams to hide malicious code. The significance of the text zone ID equals 3 is that this file in particular was downloaded from the internet. Now to get to this JPEG file stored contents in memory, we need to find its starting cluster. If we look to the left in the template view window, 
you can see that the first segment of this JPEG file begins at cluster number 52531. In order to get to this location, we need to convert this cluster number into a byte level offset. To do this, we take the cluster number 52531 and multiply it by 8 to convert it into sectors. This gives us a value of 420, 248. We then take this value and we multiply it by 512, which is the size of a sector. This gives us a value of 215, 166, 976. This is the byte level offset where the JPEG file's contents begin. I will now jump to that location. This is the starting location of the JPEG image file in flash memory. You can tell by the opening hexadecimal signature, which is FFD8FFE0. I want you to remember the byte level offset for this file for when we go to the next section. What you currently see in your screen now is the master file table record for the same JPEG photo that was just referenced previously. In the last segment, we navigated a .dd forensic file system image. In this segment, we're going to do the same thing, but we're navigating within an active mounted thumb drive. If you look to the left of your screen within the template view window, you'll see that the starting cluster is the same. It is 52531. As before, when we convert this number to a byte level offset, we get 215 166976. Now I will jump to this offset within the mounted thumb drive. You'll notice that just as before, we're at byte offset 215166976. You'll also notice that there's nothing at this location. There's nothing here but an empty sector full of zeros. So why did this happen? Why did we jump to the exact same location in memory in the exact same thumb drive twice? Only one drive has data and the other does not. The answer to that question is where leveling. The first drive we examined was a forensically captured image. It attempts to capture and preserve data in a storage device in a particular moment in time. It is possible that the storage configuration for this forensic image may change again at a later date, since the manufacturer's wear leveling algorithm is not known. As you can see for yourself, the storage configuration for the live mounted thumb drive is changed. The JPEG file's contents are no longer stored at byte offset 215 they have since been directed to other flash memory cells within the storage device based on an algorithm that is meant to evenly distribute the wear of memory cells. This is just one small example of how wear leveling creates a number of challenges for forensic examiners and data recovery experts alike. In the section that follows, I'll go back to the forensic image file and I'll manually extract the JPEG file and I'll recover it to an external folder. In this section, I'll manually extract the contents of a JPEG file from raw memory. We're back in the DD forensic image from the previous section. We're already at the byte offset of the file's starting cluster, which is 215-166-976. When I copy this file's contents, I'll paste them into a hex editor called HXD and save the contents as a JPEG file. The first thing we need to do is mark the start of the file we, we wish to recover. Next, we need to calculate where the cluster run will end. Go to the template view window on the left of your screen and get the value listed in the real size field. The number that we're looking for here is 502199. We'll take this number and add it to the value of the starting byte level offset, which is 215166976. 
This gives us a value of 215-669-175. This is our ending byte level offset. This is now the very last byte of our file. All we need to do now is mark this last byte. End of block. Now we have to copy our highlighted text. And now we need to bring up HXD. You're going to go to File, New, Paste Insert, click OK. And we're going to save this to our recovered file location. I'll just name it Recovered JPEG. Be sure to give it a .jpg extension when you save the file. You can see here's the picture that we saved. This concludes the demonstration. This has been an example of how data can be extracted using the master file table to locate a file's contents in memory. The storage media we were using in this example was a simple thumb drive and there were only a few items on it, so there was not really much concern for fragmentation in this case. The entire recovered file was one large cluster run. If this was a larger file, for example, say a high-resolution photo around 10 to 20 megabytes in size, or if it was an executable program around 1 gigabyte in size, this task would have been much more complicated. Cluster runs would have been stored throughout multiple flash memory blocks. The individual cluster runs would have to be reassembled within the destination hex editor file, hopefully with no extraneous additional bytes. This may seem like an unnecessary and time-consuming task. However, it is used under certain circumstances when all other file-carving software tools fail to accomplish their task. In closing, to further illustrate my previous statement, I can think of two recent cases where this type of surgical procedure would be called for. First, I was recently given a SanDisk card from a digital camcorder. The owner told me that two days' worth of footage had been deleted and needed to be recovered. The video files were saved as MP4 files and ranged from 80 to 250 megabytes in size. I was able to recover all of the deleted files through conventional means, but the files themselves had been corrupted by the recovery process. Therefore, they would not play. In that case, a manual recovery would be required in order to ensure that the integrity of the video files would be restored. Second, I was recently contacted by a graduate school colleague of mine who works for the Bank of America as a forensic analyst. He informed me that a 4 gigabyte email PST file had been deleted and he would have to carve it out manually in order for it to be recovered. The specific reasons for selecting this procedure were not made known to me. Although some individuals in this field believe that this procedure is purely the stuff of academia, it is in fact used when all other conventional methods of recovery fail. If done commercially, it can be very time-consuming and very, very costly, which is why some backup and recovery experts still suggest storing more valuable information on hard disk drives as it is easier to recover deleted data from them, even under the worst possible conditions.